Okay, so let's get started. Welcome everyone. We're so pleased that you've joined us today for our first ever live webinar. I'm Tammy Northam, Bladder Cancer Canada's Executive Director, and I'm your MC for today's session. So that's me right there. And today's session living well with is bladder, can bladder can living well with bladder cancer and beyond. We have over 200 registered for tonight's session, which is truly incredible for our first ever webinar. And I'm sure some more people will be, will be joining us throughout the evening. Before we get into today's presentations, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. First, to ensure the best possible audio experience for everyone, we have you all on mute in order to minimize the amount of background noise. While you'll be able to hear us speaking, you're not going to, we're not going to be able to hear you. So if you have a comment or a question during the session, the best way to, to submit your question on a computer is to type it into the question box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar panel, which is located on the right side of your screen. If you're on a mobile device like a tablet or a cell phone, click on the question mark icon at the top of the screen. Please keep in mind that we will not be able to address questions that are specific to your case, but we will do our best to answer as many of the general questions as we can. You can submit your questions throughout the webinar and there will be a general Q&A discussion following all the presentations. If we don't have time to answer your question today, please email it to info at bladdercancercanada.org and we will respond in the coming days. If you find that you're experiencing technical issues that are impacting your ability to see or hear the presentations, please send us a note in the question box and stick with us as we work to resolve the issue. Lastly, we are recording today's session. So if you get called away or disconnected due to sound or internet connection issues, keep in mind you will receive the recording via email in the coming days. This also means you shouldn't need to take too many notes and instead focus on absorbing all of the great information that our speakers have to offer. So I'm gonna kick off today's presentation with a short introduction about Bladder Cancer Canada. All right, so let's move on here. So just to give you a bit of an overview, we are the first and still the only national patient-focused bladder cancer organization. It was co-founded by two patients in 2009, just nine years ago, Jack Moon and David Gutman. Our mission is threefold, which is to support patients, increase awareness and education, and fund research into bladder cancer. We are governed by a national board of directors of 10 volunteers, consisting of a mix of patients and professionals. We have one full-time and three part-time staff. And we have over 300 volunteers right across Canada, each one involved based on their individual interests and abilities. And we also have six, over 6,000 people registered with us to receive our e-newsletter. So we actually have 25 of the top bladder cancer specialists on our medical advisory and medical research board. Uh, you may recognize a few of these individuals. We were able to grab just a few of them for a short, a quick photo last year. So this is probably about 10 of them here. Now let's talk about patient support. This is the first part of our mission. Um, it starts with our website where you'll find a wide array of helpful information. We encourage you to check it out. Over 40 volunteers are involved in our patient support program, talking to fellow patients who are in need of support via phone, email, and even in person. And we host an online discussion forum where hundreds of patients and volunteers are talking and asking questions every day. So these are just some of the people and the volunteers involved with these programs. From an education perspective, um, we offer, this year we are offering six education meetings in various locations across Canada. And we offer support groups in a number of locations as well. So you'll have to check our website out to see uh, where these are available and register for our e-newsletter to see what's coming up if you have not already. And uh, moving right along, need I mention webinars? Here we all are. Um, you're here with us on our very first webinar. And we'll offer another later in the fall on the topic of sexuality and intimacy post bladder cancer treatment. 
We have available three patient guidebooks for download on our website. These are written by patients and vetted by doctors. You can also pick one up from your local urologist. If they don't have them, they can certainly order them from Bladder Cancer Canada for free at any time. And there's also some informative videos on our website, on our YouTube channel. And just take note that these webinars will also be posted on our website for future viewing. So the second part of our mission that I'm gonna talk about is awareness. So um, many of you have probably seen the well-known uh, See Red, See Your Doctor campaign. And um, you, most of the artwork you should note has been, um, the artwork has been donated in most of the advertising space, which is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, we, you can find it on transit shelters, print media, digital screens, hospitals and doctor's offices, restrooms, and even in malls. Um, we also actually have a public service announcement that is the same messaging and it's uh, made available on a number of TV networks across Canada who are donating space to us at zero cost. And then we also strive to increase awareness among the patient community. So in order to help us do that, we have over 40 volunteer community ambassadors distributing brochures, posters, cards to cancer centers, urology offices, among many other locations. And we also have our CRED brochure placed in 1700 GP offices across Canada via donated space. So um, some of you may know that we've just wrapped up Bladder Cancer Awareness Month, which was promoted across Canada for the month of May. And our goal was to reach the 80,000 bladder cancer patients in Canada, along with their caregivers and families. So the key message this year was really drilling down into how Bladder Cancer Canada can help you. And the third part of our mission is to fund research which pursues the elimination and diagnosis of bladder cancer. Many of you may know that bladder cancer is the fifth most common cancer in Canada, yet unfortunately ranks 19th in research funding among the top 24 cancers. Bladder Cancer Canada strives to fund research projects which pursue the diagnosis, treatment and elimination of bladder cancer. And in 2018, we will have reached the $1.35 million mark in funding since our, since our inception. And finally, in addition to our mission, we advocate on behalf of patients for access to new and effective treatments, ensuring critical supply of drugs such as BCG. We are the Canadian voice for bladder cancer patients. We make patients aware of their right to a second opinion or a referral to a specialist. And um, we really strive for earlier diagnosis and earlier di diagnostic screening of bladder cancer. And finally, which we've mentioned before, is increasing funding for bladder cancer research. <clears throat> and finally, we need to talk to you about the Bladder Cancer Canada Awareness Walk. Last year, the walk raised over $600,000 nationally and is responsible for allowing us to do what we do representing 65% of our total revenue for the year. And the purpose to bring people together, to connect, to learn, and to help make a difference. In 2018, the Awareness Walk will be taking place in 22 cities, but you can also walk where you are. I should mention this, if, you, if there's not a walk in your city, we have a page on our site that allows you to register and walk wherever it is that you are. The national date is September 23rd, and please visit bccwalk.ca for more information or to register. We can't do this without you. All right, so I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes here, a couple of seconds to turn the presentation over to our next presenter. Just bear with me here. Okay. There we go. So now I'd like to turn things over 
to Amy Sweeney. Amy is a registered kinesiologist and cancer exercise specialist from Vancouver. We connected with Amy because she helped one of our volunteers to recover from a cystectomy and a neobladder diversion and regain his continence and quality of life. Today, Amy will talk about the importance of exercise when facing bladder cancer. Amy, over to you. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> Alrighty, so um, as uh, Temi mentioned there, I am a cancer exercise specialist and so I'm going to talk about the importance of exercise. So we're really fortunate that only about a month ago, I, uh, sorry it's not going over, there we go, a month ago a, um, the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia came out with a statement and um, the gist of it really is saying that based on what the science is telling us, exercise is the best medicine people with cancer can take. In addition to their cancer treatments to reverse treatment related side effects, slow the progression of their cancer, increase quality of life and improve chances of survival. So I'll kind of just talk about uh, why those were found. All right, so we also, I'd like to just quickly touch base on that we've really come a long way. Um, so exercise has been found, as I mentioned, safe and well-tolerated intervention. Um, American College of Sports of Medicine, as well as other programs, have come out uh, with an actual formula for how the exercise guidelines should be done um, to make sure that it's a safe and uh, a safe environment for everyone and um, so we do appropriate screening prescription and recommendations so we'll actually be looking at your situation are you coming up to a surgery have you gone through surgery did you do radiation chemotherapy or the immune therapy as everyone's experience is completely different than the other i've never met someone who has gone through the same experience they may have had the same uh, treatment but the side effects are differently so really uh this is kind of where it comes most important exercise lessens your your side effects so uh, you may be experiencing fatigue neuropathy cardiovascular health losing bone density uh, muscle atrophy meaning you're starting to lose muscle mass your sleep is getting worse, your range of motion is being affected, so your joints are getting achy, um, you are either gaining or losing too much weight, or you're, you're experiencing a lot of inflammation, so your lymphatic system isn't flushing properly. So exercise can really help with all of these uh, factors. And there's some few other reasons as to why to exercise. So we can enhance our quality of life. So elevates your mood, helps with your memory, decreases stress and anxiety. It also just your confidence overall. And also when we go through treatment, a lot of times our, our hormones can go out of whack and that can really help as well. And then obviously, as I'm sure a lot of us know, exercise can help with other diseases such as obesity, diabetes, cholesterol, and increase our white cell blood count. Um, it also increases our survival rates, um, so rates sorry, with appropriate guidelines. So this is just kind of brushing over and I'll be able to kind of talk more in depth soon. Um, the, so if we're just sitting around, so the biggest thing with fatigue is oftentimes we're, we get really, really tired and we just wanna lie down and we don't feel like we're doing much. So these are just the factors of if we're not moving around and moving our body, we tend to see a big decrease in our muscle mass, increase in our fat mass. Again, that bone density. So for women, especially osteoporosis becomes a huge factor and our balance uh, gets affected as well. And when that happens, we're more likely to fall. And if we have that osteoporosis, we're gonna break our arm or something like that and it could become very dangerous. So um, it's again, a really important to keep moving. And there's an increased risk of developing other health-related diseases and that reduction of quality of life. So there's also research that was completed uh, recently in 2017, sorry, uh, that 47%, uh, there was, sorry, there was a decrease in risk of bladder cancer death uh, by 47% when we exercise and keep that body moving. So, 
I would say it, when in terms of bladder cancer, considering a lot of us are experiencing from surgery, that when the muscle is cut, you find that those muscles will actually completely shut down. And then we experience the bladder, bladder control issues, as well as for men, uh, will often be that erectile dysfunction, which I know they're going to be talking about in a few months in the next talk. Uh, but the pelvic floor, now this is probably the most important thing when it comes to exercise and rehabbing. Now, um, as mentioned, I came here from uh, working with one of the volunteers. Now, he came to me before his surgery. Now, this made a drastic improvement on post-surgery and his, his rehabilitation. So a lot of people often don't know how to engage their pelvic floor, and I think it's a really important thing. So I'm just going to take a second to walk you through it. You're welcome to take the time to follow my instructions or you may not want to. Women may have a little bit easier time doing this as we all know that we're supposed to do Kegels, especially if you've had children. Uh, so I want you to just take a second to close your eyes, take a big deep breath in, and you're going to just kind of as if you have to stop a pee. So you're gonna pull up. So for the boys, it's almost kind of like you pull the boys up and uh, you're just kind of holding that pee in and you just hold it for about two seconds and then release. Now, a lot of times when we're doing this, we want to clench our butt cheeks together. We don't want you to do that. You want to just be able to focus on just engaging that bladder control. And now if you do that, maybe twice a day, you know, five to eight, ten of them each time, this is going to make a significant difference for you. Now, I just want to kind of talk briefly or not briefly this is where we're going to get a little bit more deeper into it but uh, talk about those side effects that you're really going to experience when it comes to your treatment so fatigue being a big one uh, it's not the same as being tired this lingers even after your treatment is finished and I would say with most of my clients this has got to be the most frustrating side effect the reason for this is they feel like you wake up in the morning, you feel completely energized and off you want to go with your day. And all of a sudden you realize that halfway through your day, it's like you've hit a wall. Yet all you've done is you've walked to the grocery store and grabbed breakfast and then walked home. So don't be hard on yourself. Just acknowledge that getting up and moving is good. That is the number one step. And now, and I also like to say, I don't give difficult exercises. A lot of people hear exercise. And when they hear exercise, they think you're going to the gym, you're running around, you're jumping, you're lifting these heavy weights, you're feeling the burn. I'm sure most of us have heard no pain, no gain. That is absolutely a misconception. You can do exercises lying down. And there's simple movements that can be extremely difficult for us to do, and they really will help target that muscle strength and the importance of it and why it will help you get stronger and move and help with your fatigue. But the thing is, is again, you have to go slow. Now, if you go too fast and you push yourself too much, you can actually have the wrong effect. So as it says here, dose response relationship. So if you work out too much or you push yourself too much, your immune systems are already affected and you may find that you actually are gonna get sicker. So just be honest with yourself, listen to your body, take the time that you need. And so again, as it's already been mentioned, exercise will also improve your mood, your strength, and your cardiovascular system. So you'll see a little quote here from NBC News. This was only about within the last year. Patients still in treatment may not feel up to much. The guidelines acknowledge, but should avoid inactivity on good or good days. So inactivity, yeah. Okay. So I do realize, I just noticed here, that it's a little bit of a typo here. So that 43%, um, it's very similar to that. Um, it's a, just a little bit lower. There is no specific number, but they say just below half um, of people will begin to experience depression and memory loss while you are going through treatment. Uh, a lot of this is due to 
as soon as we hear the word cancer, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, everything else kind of stops. And we become very focused on taking care of that part. And we don't realize the rest of what's happening around us. And a lot of us can fall into depression and without even noticing it. And you don't treat it. Um, a lot of these reasons are ones that I've already kind of touched base on. So if we are experiencing uh, urine incontinence, uh, erectile dysfunction, weight gain, and we've been someone who's been extremely active your entire life, and then all of a sudden, like I said, you can't walk a few blocks without just being completely exhausted for the next four days. Uh, fatigue, loss of muscle. So I know I've come across a lot of individuals who've, again, been very strong their entire life, and then all of a sudden, they're watching people around them picking up all these crazy weight or kicking up their kids and moving them around and they can't do that. Uh, we've also come across people where it's just, they're being given prescription after prescription medication and it's just so hard to, to control and be aware of that it's just, it becomes too much and they fall into this depression and their memory just kind of starts to run away. <laughs> And so exercise can help with that. It really shows that as we, we exercise, we're actually creating some more neurological connections in the brain. It can also, again, maintain your weight. It can provide more energy and increase your strength. And again, going back to those Kegels, and if you do work on your pelvic floor, it has been found the stronger that we work on that and the more we work on that, you can, I cannot say for sure, unfortunately, that it will solve your urine incontinence or your erectile dysfunction, but it can definitely help. And it's something that without doing, it's very hard to get back. So the next one I'd really like to talk about is your immune system. So I know with the majority of treatments people go through, our immune system has been dropped quite a bit. So when we exercise, we are increasing our white cell blood count. And when we increase our white cell blood count, you find that you're you're able to fight against all the the cancer cells again to make yourself stronger and it as your cardiovascular system's working better and everything's pumping through better you're able to fight your infectious diseases your metabolism's working better your sugar is under control it allows your body to actually focus on what it's doing to fight against the cancer versus being so focused on these other problems that are going through our body that can be affecting our immune system and making it a lot worse. So when I also talk about this, this is really why it's so important that we find a facility where they work with specifically people that are going through what everyone is in on this talk are going through in, in terms of being diagnosed with cancer, any form of cancer. Now, my clinic specifically, if anyone is sick, we cannot come in. And we are always very aware. We want to make sure that there is nothing that can make someone or expose people to illnesses. So it's really important to find an environment that works for you and has that empathy and understanding as well as what you're going through. Now, I already kind of mentioned in terms of what the exercise is. Again, it doesn't have to be going into the gym and going really, 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 really hard. Every person is different. So some people who are going through this, it, you might be still going to the gym and going hard, but other people may need to take it a lot easier. So there's exercises such as clamshells and bridges and this, even the, the pelvic floor exercises. And honestly, a simple, deep breathing exercise. Now, a lot of us breathe through our chest and breathing through our belly can actually wake up your abdominal muscles. So these in themselves are exercises and it's shocking to people on how much they can make a difference. So 
again, don't be hard on yourself. Just understand that it's a step-by-step -step process and just take it easy and, you know, only start. You, you want to get 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity. Vigorous for some may just be getting out for a walk. So five days a week, you want to get up 30 minutes of movement. I wouldn't even necessarily say exercise to start with because when you're dealing with fatigue, movement is key. If you can, we want to we want to do resistance training two days per week. And I won't be able to show it to you, but there is... Um, a video 23 and a half hours uh, that you can find on YouTube and it just talks about how you know when we struggle to get up and get moving it's a really nice way to kind of get that little bit of a push to start our ex exercises now our guidelines in risk reduction so there's proper warm-up and cool down so we always want to make sure we give ourselves a minimum of five minutes to get our body moving and then also at the end of our exercises to decrease our heart rate before we just go off with the regular day now we want to do slow repetitive movements so if we're kind of pushing hard and we're going really fast and kind of using momentum we're not actually strengthening our muscles. By going nice and slowly, you're actually challenging your muscles at every, at every angle. And when you're doing that, you're providing strength throughout the whole muscle instead of just those power muscle areas. And as I've already talked about, it is a gradual pro progression. And working with a trained professional. So, you can go to the gym and you can find a personal trainer, but there's not a lot of people who are such as myself who are cancer exercise specialists. It is again becoming more and more popular and we are actually in the midst of uh, creating a program to train other people who are like-minded like us. But there are a lot of kinesiologists and very well-informed trainers out there that you just need to go out and find the right fit for you. Find someone who understands, well, who can empathize with what you're going through and take you through that very gradual, slow, and careful and safe environment through your exercises to make sure you're really being aware of what, how your body is reacting to these. Uh, don't work out in really high heats and high altitudes. Our bodies are already kind of going through enough. This will create some major problems. And uh, complete, and, and always make sure you complete and understand the risk assessments. So there'll be questions such as, do you have any other heart conditions and things like that? And uh, most people be okay, but if uh, you just wanna make sure your trainer is very well aware of your medical history, even of previous broken arms and injuries and things like that. So um, if you want to ever kind of take, figure out what, where your heart rate wants to work. So you always kind of want to work in a 75% heart rate when you're working on your cardiovascular system. So this is a pretty quick and easy way of um, calculating it, uh, which I would just say, email me if you would like it. You don't need to write this down, um, but uh, you're welcome to ask more questions about this. Um, but for most of us, we just want to work in our rate of perceived exertion. So there, it's a scale of a 1 to 10. 10 being this is the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. And 1 being it's super, super simple. So you want to work in a kind of like a 6 zone where you really feel like you're pushing and you can feel that heart rate coming in. and it's, But it's not so hard that you can't do this uh, resistance so we always want to make sure we're doing hand weights exercise bands but there's a lot of other things that we can do in body weight I there's TRX machines we can do um, I like to do inclined push-ups so don't try and get on the ground just all of a sudden do 20 push-ups really focus on having that incline so doing it on your countertop 
and just moving your body, uh, which is kind of coming into that functional movement. And uh, flexibility and range of motion are also extremely important. Now, as we get older, our range of motion gets uh, worse. And as our range of motion, so when we can't go into a certain range, we're actually going to find that you're no longer working your muscle in that range that you cannot get to. So when you're able to stretch and then allow yourself to move in a bigger range, you're going to be able to start strengthening that muscle a little bit more. So it's really important that we can we keep a big range of motion. If we've already lost a lot of range of motion, again, take gradual baby steps. Let's progress ourselves through that. Now, most of us are gonna have barriers to the exercise. If it's time, fatigue, depression, you don't like to exercise, I don't, uh, you don't know what or how to exercise, uh, the, the side effects are just completely debilitating, lack of support or weather, again, just move. You don't have to go to the gym. You can, you know, I think it's on the next slide. Find find a friend just to go for a walk with. Get a dog, you know, just move around your house. Vacuuming, laundry, lawn, lawn, like mowing your lawn. All those sort of things are exercise and they're movement and they're so important. Um, I do see that there is a quick little question here. And so um, when I, so I apologize. Um, when I was talking about treatments, all of these treatments are important. So surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and immune therapy. Exercise is important for all of them. Uh, there's even a story where when I used to volunteer at a place here in Inspire, uh, called Inspire Health that helps those, um, everyone with cancer. And uh, the uh, doctor was actually talking about a woman who went through chemotherapy and was a year and a half out of her treatments and started exercising. After she, when she started exercising, she started to actually experience the same side effects she was experiencing when she was going through chemotherapy. It turned out that her chemotherapy actually was being stored in her fat cells. And as she was exercising, it was being released again. So that's exactly like so it's really important and um you can get the chemo out of your body a little bit, a bit better all right so um that is everything um i hope it's given you a little bit of information you are more than welcome to email me at amy at botf.ca uh really this is <laughs> there's a lot so uh i try to keep it short so feel free to contact me at any time Thanks. All right, thanks so much, um, Amy, for taking the time to be with us today. And if anyone's in Vancouver and surrounding area, please let us know, and we're certainly happy to put you in touch directly if you don't catch these details uh, right now. So just give me a moment here. I'm going to turn the mouse over to our next presenter, and then I'll proceed to introduce her. All right, so next up is Astrid Quenville, registered dietitian, specializing in oncology at the Jurvinsky Cancer Center in Hamilton. We asked Astrid to join us today because she did such a great presentation at our patient education meeting in Hamilton last year. Her presentation today is on nutrition, the hype, the evidence, and the verdict. Astrid, take it away if you're already there. Thank you, Tammy. So I'm very pleased to be here today. It was such an honor to be invited and I am wanting to review with you the nutritional aspects of um, bladder cancer and hopefully give you some practical advice. I'm not sure I can advance my slides. Okay, let me give it a whirl here. Okay. There we go. Thank you. 
So uh, our title is The Hype, the Evidence and the Verdict. Hopefully we can walk through the nutritional recommendations and pinpoint the most important things to be focusing on. And cutting through some of the hype or some of the um, misleading information that is um, quite promoted out there. Okay, um, so this slide just highlights the importance of nutrition, just like Amy was reviewing the importance of physical activity throughout our life. Uh, nutrition is important at each step and including in the cancer journey. Uh, so nutrition is very important in terms of uh, keeping our body well, uh, the best we can give our body the uh, nutrients that it needs. We're hoping to prevent malnutrition, helping our body uh, work at its optimal level and specifically through surgery, radiation and chemotherapy as well as immunotherapy, it is really important that people can help themselves to maintain their weight and maintain their muscle mass as um, related also to what Amy was reviewing tonight. And throughout the uh, cancer experience with many of these um, therapies, there can be some side effects, the nausea, the difficulty with taste changes, uh, like a lot of the uh, GI as well. And we know that um, nutrition is, like it's important to be doing the best you can throughout each of those experiences. If you do run into a um, significant problem with these, there is some good information, especially through the Canadian Cancer Society. But if these uh, side effects are acute, we certainly want you to reach out to your primary care team and hopefully come up with a plan to uh, manage those. Our, talk tonight is going to focus mostly on the general aspects of bladder cancer and nutrition because those individual side effects can be quite um, personal and uh, needing a specific um, strategy. So okay Amy so to... just let me know when you'd like to go to the next slide. Oh next one. So, as I was highlighting, during treatment, you do want to um, maintain your weight and meet your protein requirements, especially if you think about all of the healing that's happening and keeping your body strong with its muscle mass and the importance of uh, management of the side effects. Yeah, next slide. So, uh, in the guidance that we want to be um, recommending, using the best evidence that is available, we turn to the um, World Cancer Research Fund that has um, been analyzing all of the research. The first report was released in 2015 and it has recently been revised. So in this report, um, it uh, analyzes 45 studies from around the world comprising of more than 7 million adults and nearly 37,000 cases of blad can bladder cancer. So it is a, quite a, a huge report and I am giving you the, um, the reference to it uh, at the last slide but uh, the recommendations haven't changed much since 2015 and the next slide shows you the uh, chart that we turn to for the summary of evidence. So similarly to in 2015 arsenic in water has a strong uh, evidence that it promotes uh, bladder cancer and this is most significant in developing countries. There is still limited suggestive evidence that vegetables and fruit as well as tea uh, can decrease the risk of uh, bladder cancer. Many other components of the diet as well as vitamins and some minerals as well as some lifestyle factors such as the waist circumference has been uh, evaluated as well but these studies are limited and there has been no conclusion that could be made as a proper recommendation uh, moving forward. But the uh, continuous update pro uh, um, 
project is ongoing and these guidelines are going to be reviewed ongoing and uh, new uh, information is going to be found. Uh, these studies are difficult uh, sometimes to uh, pinpoint an exact factor that's going to make a big difference with an exact disease. Uh, more and more we're realizing that the guidelines are more taken out as a package in terms of people doing all the right things that's going to be the most helpful. So if you can go to the next slide. These are the recommendations that have been around since 2007 and the most recent uh, uh, release of the uh, expert report hasn't changed uh, really the um, flavor of these uh, guidelines. So we're going to work through together a little bit of the main concepts found here. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so this is some uh, specific um, recommendations found in some of the topics that they're uh, um, highlighting here as recommendations. And so I just wanted to show you the uh, actual facts that I'm not making this up and that um, these are true um, evidence-based suggestions and recommendations. So looking at the um, be as lean and possi as possible. Often as dietitians, weight is not one of the things that we want to be exactly focusing on, but just knowing that uh, carrying around extra weight, especially in the mid area, uh, is uh, related to many diseases, including many cancers, not specifically yet found to be uh, correlated with uh, bladder cancer, however. Uh, the physical aspects of um, a healthy lifestyle was reviewed already. Um, limiting consumption of energy-rich foods, uh, looking at the importance of a plant-based diet, uh, limiting consumption of red meats, as well as uh, avoiding alcohol as much as possible. So if you go to the next slide, we're going to drill down a little bit into the uh, area of the sugar content of the diet. There is a popular idea that sugar feeds cancer. Well, sugar feeds all cells, so that you can't really starve your body or your tumor by reducing your donut and your candy bar intake. But we know that um, those uh, foods that are high in calories often don't give us the nutritional factors or micronutrients that we need. So that if I'm spending my day eating more Joe Louis and Twinkies and drinking Coke or, um, you know, eating uh, f those fruit uh, roll-ups and that, instead of having my apples and my oranges, my broccoli, then uh, there's more chances that I'm not going to be getting the nutrients that I need. And overweight is a risk factor, as I mentioned, for many cancers, as well as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We know specifically for the sugar uh, that if you do have diabetes, it is really important throughout the cancer experience that you try and uh, make have a good um, blood glucose level throughout the uh, experiences as much as possible. If you go to the next slide, the guidelines for sugar from the World Health Organization uh, that were released a few years ago uh, do recommend that not more than six teaspoons of added sugar for women and not more than nine teaspoons for men in a day. And if you start looking at your labels of any processed foods, you'll see that this is a very small uh, leeway of uh, an acceptance book acceptable intake. So the more and more we're recommending that people limit processed foods or maybe just have them on occasion, any kind of habit is something that you're doing regularly. If you're uh, celebrating an anniversary or a birthday and you have an extra sugar uh, intake on that day, that's not what we, the, the type of thing we're focusing on. We're focusing on uh, people's habits of what they're doing on a daily or weekly basis. So the next slide. Uh, so we're recommending people drink more water, that they do avoid alcohol as much as possible. Uh, even that uh, uh, red wine that's been promoted for um, heart, uh, we don't really recommend that. Um, 
alcohol is seen now as a class one carcinogen and should be avoided not more um, as much as possible. If people are going to be um, engaging in drinking alcohol, it's not more than one a day standard uh, alcoholic beverages for women and not more than two a day and not to be going over that limit. And uh, as I was highlighting, there is a lot of hidden sugars in a lot of your beverages and the new recommendations really do strongly recommend that people avoid those sweetened beverages as much as possible. If you go to the next slide. So plants are our friends. We're going to get lots of different uh, nutrients from our beans, from our vegetables, from our grains and seeds. Um, as you can see, the more different colors of uh, these um, are going to give you different uh, nutrients and the more variety is going to help your body um, get the best out of its um, diet. So if you go to the next slide. So there are many choices of our plants. Uh, if somebody doesn't like okra or rather not have um, cantaloupe, that's fine. Just try and work with as many of the different ones that you can get. The most uh, powerful aspect of the uh, cancer uh, diet is the um, focus on getting your vegetables and getting your fruits. I've given you the specific amounts here, about two and a half cups a day for vegetables and two cups a day for fruits. This is where you're going to get the most powerful anti-cancer fighting uh, properties. So the more variety you can get is going to be ideal. If you go to the next slide. So the different colors I'm highlighting, the white ones, uh, the yellow and orange and red and blue and the green ones, uh, trying to get the most colorful uh, diet that you can. The next slide. And that's going to indicate the uh, different phytochemicals you're going to get from the different colors. So if you think about garlic being a strong smell, you know that's going to have some uh, uh, biomedically active components. The pomegranate juice, if you do spill it on your shirt, it's going to stain. So that's, you know, if you're going to be getting some good uh, nutritional compounds in there. In the most perfect way, much better than getting any kind of supplements. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so there is uh, a word out there that's uh, been promoted mostly in marketing and it's superfood that really doesn't mean anything. So if somebody is trying to promote something as being a superfood, well it's just a food. There's no such thing. If you go to the next slide. So meat, if people want to be incorporating meat in their diet, we do advise them on some specific specific um, guidelines if you go to the next slide. So not more than 350 grams to 500 grams a week of beef, pork, lamb. That's more related to uh, colon cancer. Um, and just to highlight that uh, the actual recommendation of the portion that you need for the day is about the palm of the size of your hand of any kind of protein. So that's including your um, poultry, your eggs, fish, seeds, nuts, and always we want to be promoting the variety aspect there, just so that your body is going to be getting the most uh, of different uh, nutrients. And um, there is uh, well-known knowledge that processed meats, that's things that are cured or salted, um, can cause some um, negative aspects in our stomachs when um, we're digesting them. So that uh, we ask people to uh, look for some reduced sodium or reduced preservative uh, content at the deli counter if they're choosing some sliced meats, for example. So again, as I was mentioning, it's the habits that generally. If somebody's at the ballpark and occasionally having something like a hot dog, that's not the focus. It's somebody having them regularly in their diet that's going to make a difference. So the next slide, yeah, um, go the other way. Yeah, so uh, as a um, summary, there are a lot of different diets that are promoted uh, for different um, health reasons and so far, the, these diets, like the vegetarian diet, the ketogenic diet that's um, right now quite popular, uh, the juicing, the uh, paleo, the gluten-free, organic, those diets have not been uh, shown to have uh, significant um, 
impact on um, the risk of uh, cancer. And that includes even the Mediterranean diet I was reading in a new study. Uh, the ketogenic diet, if you've heard about it, it's a really high fat diet. It's used in the epilepsy population and it has shown good results there. It's not yet proven or uh, recommended in cancer, but it is highly researched right now. It is a hard diet to follow when you're thinking about mostly having mayonnaise and sour cream and very little uh, carbohydrate or protein. But there's a lot of books out there on lots of these diets and uh, a lot of like magic bullets uh, um, that are uh, promoted um, to the cancer population. I was hoping tonight that we could at least uh, kind of review um, the most important things to be doing with uh, your nutrition. So the next slide summarizes um, what we would consider an eating pattern that is well balanced. And we look at doing the right thing about 80% of the time. Uh, so that's, um, you know, nobody's going to be perfect, but you look at uh, trying to incorporate the variety, trying to get your fruits and vegetables in as your first thing and work on uh, uh, getting the proper portions on your plate. Um, just to highlight that the size of your plate is going to matter as well. If you are at all um, finding yourself outside the healthy weight range, like on the higher side, um, using a small plate is um, a good start to be uh, helping with portion uh, management. If you go to the next slide. Um, the uh, Supplements that are promoted, there is a, a ton. It is a billion dollar industry. There is no supplements yet in research that has been found to be as effective as food. Uh, so food is parceled in its best perfect way for your body to utilize it. So if you go to the next slide, uh, just to highlight that the Canadian Cancer Society doesn't recommend across the board any uh, supplements of vitamins or minerals and even some concentrated sources could be harmful when you're getting uh, to uh, uh, high levels. If you go to the next slide, just a touch on vitamin D. If you're interested in um, supplementing with it, do talk about it with your physician. The next slide. Uh, the bottom line is eat more fruits and vegetables, add variety to your menu, allowing your body to benefit from uh, many of the um, plant chemicals, adding legumes, that's a dried peas and uh, beans, as well as whole grains to your daily regimen. These will be some of the most important things that you could be doing uh, to help your body. Next slide. And just to uh, go back to uh, these are the guidelines and uh, the next slide I believe has the resources. So the second one, the dietandcancerreport.org is where you can find all the listing and the evidence uh, uh, that I, I presented this evening. And some of the other uh, uh, websites are uh, just of interest in terms of um, uh, healthy eating. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Astrid, for being with us again today and uh, providing some valuable information that I'm sure will be of benefit to everyone. Folks in Hamilton and region are invited to contact her directly, so you can email us at Bladder Cancer Canada for her contact details. All right, so I'm just going to take a moment here to switch our presentation mode and our mouse over to the next speaker, if you'll just give me a moment, and then I'll introduce. Our next speaker, Claire Edmonds. Okay. So, Claire, you should be able to click and then start to proceed through your slides. In the meantime, I will introduce you. Great. Our last pr presenter this evening is Claire Edmonds, a registered psychotherapist working at a variety of community cancer organizations in and around Toronto. At Wellspring, she leads the Healing Journey, a support program for cancer patients and caregivers. She develops programs and trains professionals. Claire has also coped with cancer herself, which has profoundly deepened her understanding of the cancer experience. Claire's topic for today is how can I help you? The psychosocial needs of cancer patients. And with that, I would like to turn things right over to Claire. 
That's great. Thanks so much. A real pleasure to be here with you this evening. And there's been so much great information shared. It's been uh, really fascinating. So here I am. I'm about to talk about the psychosocial needs of people coping with cancer, bladder cancer specifically. So really, when it comes to psychosocial needs of people coping with cancer, it's not a one size all <laughs> kind of proposition. Everybody has different needs. Everybody has a different story. And so because of age and situation, support varies amongst people. And so I'm hoping that today you'll hear some aspects that relate to you. And support needs are also a moving target, just like our kitten here is working hard to nail that finger. Um, what we find is that people who are coping with cancer, their needs can change quite quickly, depending on their treatment, depending where they're at. Um, and so this could really be a challenge for caregivers. Uh, it really keeps caregivers on their toes. There we are. So support is rather like a series of circles that surround the patient and the family. And these circles uh, can involve the medical needs of the patient. Another circle are the closest and nearest friends and family. And then there are broader needs like spiritual needs and community needs. And so everybody's circles are slightly different, but it's really helpful to identify who is there for you when you need help. And so the early days, and I'm sure that um, in speaking to you all, you will remember the early days as being very difficult. There is shock and fear and frustration, terrible feeling of powerlessness, and also feeling lost and dislocated. And sadly, uh, getting engaged in the help that you need at the hospital, getting your medical care organized, can often feel like a hurry up and wait kind of situation. And so everybody feels better when the plan is developed. And I'm talking about the plan for treatment, to know what's coming up. The next step gives the patient and caregivers a sense of what they need to do and how this experience is going to unfold. However, there's often waiting before the plan gets set up, before it is implemented. And so during this early time, there's often a fear that your chart may have gotten lost in the system. You may have great fears about what kind of treatment you're going to have. You may be coping with the losses and wondering, how am I going to cope? And often we also ask, how is my family going to cope, my loved ones? And often the big question underlying all of it is, will I survive? The initial diagnosis is really experienced as a shock and in some ways a trauma. And so these questions and anxieties are often heightened when people are waiting to know what their treatment plan is going to be. So communication with the system becomes really important. This kind of communication is a sense that your chart has landed on the right desk and having someone you can talk to about these questions that are probably emerging pretty quickly. One person who can help you at this point in time is your family physician. Family physicians can help navigate the patient and the family through those early days of making sure that the right person knows and that the chart and information is being moved properly. Caregivers are often experiencing many of the same feelings of fear, anxiety, and worry, so that having someone to talk to, like the family physician, can be really helpful. You can go and talk to your family physician, check up on the progress of how the hospital is organizing your care. It's a place to talk about your concerns and your worries. Now, the caregiver can have a big role at this stage of the game. When the information starts coming about the various appointments and tests and professionals that you need to meet with, having someone keep track 
of all of that information in a notebook and a calendar is really helpful. Questions and concerns pop up at any time, and sometimes it's hard to recall them in the doctor's office when the pressure is on. So this notebook can record all your concerns and questions and symptoms, and the date book is for managing the appointments. You're also going to want to keep all that contact information in a convenient place as well. Now, some hospitals have programs like MyChart so that patients can pull up their medical information online and also have a list of their appointments. Have a look in your hospital to see if that kind of resource is available. But this kind of organization often falls to the caregiver and it's of great care and uh, really helps the patient feel more in control. I think we've stalled out though, there we go. So the medical team is going to be larger than your surgeon, more than your oncologist or your radiation oncologist. There are a lot of people within the system that can be there to help you in different ways. Nurses, chemo nurses, nurse practitioners, nurse navigators, and don't we know dietitians are helpful? That was such a helpful um, presentation that we just listened to. Social workers, psychologists, even pastoral care. I found the pharmacists were remarkably knowledgeable and helpful. And so while any individual on that team may or may not be more or less approachable, identify one or two people that you feel that you can talk to if you need information or if you're wondering how things are going or wondering when next appointments are coming up. You don't have to get along with everybody on the team, but it's helpful to know who is there for you. And those are the kinds of names that you're going to be collecting in your notebook. These slides are coming a little slowly. I'm wondering if you could move the slide for me. Are we stuck? Oh, there we go. It's an emotional roller coaster, which is kind of how I feel as I'm doing this work. No, I think here we go. Health information and research. I'm sorry, we're just getting a bit of a glitch here. So information is is a tricky piece of business. Um, information is only good as its source. I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and information is an aspect of care that can be a little tricky. Wonderful if it's comforting, but not so helpful if it is worrying. And information, unless it's coming directly from your healthcare team, is rarely tailor-made. And there are so many different kinds of cancer and so many different stories within each type. It may be hard for you to find the relevant information for your story, for your case. And finding information that is useful is more helpful than finding information that's alarming. So go to the source. Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, oncological therapists, they're all good sources of information because they can match it with your specific situation. The internet is great, but it can be tricky, as the quality of the source could be questionable, unless it is well, well recognized, like Bladder Cancer Canada or the Canadian Cancer Society. University and hospital websites are also good, and internet searches themselves can be exhausting. And one of the things that you might want to do is nominate someone else to do the searches for you and to very specific questions that you have. This is one of those things that caregivers and friends and family might be better uh, suited to, to do this particular job. And so emotional support, uh, it's an emotional roller coaster. And for the patient, there are going to be days that feel very low and scary, and other moments that are almost high and euphoric. And the very rapidity or the speed of the changes in emotion can be alarming. I've heard people say that they feel like they're going crazy because they just can't seem to depend upon their mood. And caregivers are kind of on yesterday's news. And so the red line, which is going up and down there, we can think of that as the patient's roller coaster. And then the green line is the caregiver's roller coaster. So just as the patient's feelings are going up and down, the caregiver is too. 
and they're always trying to figure out where their loved one is. I can remember my partner saying to me, you know, you were okay five minutes ago. <laughs> what changed? He was always sort of trying to keep up with me. And so there are lots of different kinds of support available. And I want to, first of all, talk about two different kinds of support. There's emotional support and there's practical support. Now, emotional support is sitting and listening, listening to how you are doing with a soft, open curiosity and concern. Good listeners ask how you are, and they generally want a response that's a little more detailed than, I'm okay. They take their time. They listen from the heart, and they don't try to change your mind or judge you for how you feel. With friends like this, you can tell them that you are scared and anxious, and they'll sit with that, asking you more about it, rather than telling you everything's just going to be okay, or trying to change your mind to think more positively. It's okay not to feel positive all the time, and in fact, that would be rather crazy. It would be a denial of the seriousness of the situation. Your feelings are going to be more like that roller coaster. And sometimes it's your caregivers are a few swings behind you. And I'm going to talk about the family in a moment. Instrumental support has a different quality to it. These are people who are good at doing things. They roll up their sleeves and they walk in and they ask what they can do or they directly offer. Let me do your gardening. Let me move the snow for you. May I get you a meal for next Wednesday? I've got the car this week. Can I give you a lift to the hospital? Can I come to your appointment with you? These are the people that are practical and they're wonderful people. We want to be able to identify in those concentric circles of care who are the ones that are stepping up to do the practical things. Of course, all of this relies at some level on you learning how to ask for help. And boy, is that the biggest challenge for most of us. I think it's really helpful when it comes to think about asking for help to remember how you felt when somebody asked you to help them. It's often a feeling of a real honor to be brought into someone's circle and asked to be of assistance. And so what we can do when we ask for help is offer several options and be clear about what you need. If you ask for a meal, it's a good idea to say, you know, next Wednesday it would really help me if you could make me a meal because I have my treatment that day and I'm too tired to cook. That way the person doesn't think they're going to be making a meal for you every Wednesday. It's helpful to make it time limited and clear. And sometimes if it gets too confusing and you're too tired and there's too much going on, you can ask one of your organized friends if they could help you organize one of your circles of care. For instance, if they could organize a calendar for meals or organize a calendar for drives amongst the many people or the people who want to step forward. And I'm thinking of the community and neighbors, perhaps your church group. And it's always important to express your gratitude. If someone does something for you, let them know that it was helpful because it's this kind of feedback that lets people know they're getting it right. When I was ill, I used to have a little package of cards right beside my chair and I would just write a line or two. Hey, Bob, thanks so much for giving me a lift. It made a big difference. Little notes like that can be helpful. And now, our nearest and dearest, the closest people to us may have the hardest time asking or talking to you or listening to you. Family and close caregivers have fears and anxieties of themse for themselves. And out of love, they may be inclined to say things like, I know everything's just going to be okay. They may not be able to stay present with your distress. And they can almost feel like, a conspiracy of positive thinking, a dance of sorts where no one wants to express their deeper feelings for fear of upsetting each other. Sometimes it's easier to talk to people who are a little more detached. 
And we can find those people through other sources of support. Bladder Cancer Canada, of course, has peer support, marvelous volunteers who have been there. Wellspring, too, has support and groups and lots of programs. So if you're feeling the need to talk and it's hard to talk to people who are close to you, why not phone up Bladder Cancer Canada and speak to a peer support volunteer? And so during treatment, what well, we often find sometimes our emotional needs dip because everybody feels like they're doing something. It feels active. However, feelings of depression can arise, especially if the treatment is hard and the patient feels very dislocated from their usual routine of life, such as work and other pleasurable activities. Tiredness from treatment, lack of appetite, difficulty sleeping, mood swings, feeling withdrawn. These can all be symptoms of depression, but they can also be side effects of treatment. Do let your team know, your healthcare team know, if these symptoms become troublesome. And of course, in time, treatment can be finished. And this be starts a new phase. Often friends and family are all ready to celebrate the end of treatment. And at first, the patient, too, may feel exuberant. However, patients often report that this is also a very hard time because they're no longer actively engaged in the treatment of the disease. And sometimes they have to take in everything that has happened to them. I think of this post-treatment time as a period of adjustment. And this is when sadness and grief, profound exhaustion and confusion can begin to be felt. And often we have very unrealistic expectations about what we can do and when we can do it. Treatment is hard and it takes time for the body to regain its energy. And our expectations might be way out of line, like I'm finished chemo, I should be better now. Well, not until your body recuperates. And during this period of time, we may discover that in our lives, some of our friends and support people are sprinters and others are marathoners. Sprinters are wonderful. They step in immediately in the crisis. They are active and engaged when things are first happening. Marathoners are friends and support that hangs in there for the long haul. People who know that there is real, no real finishing line in the cancer experience. They're the ones who will still be asking you, how are you doing? A year or even several years after coping with cancer. And there will also be spikes in need, moments when needs increase, things that are triggering like regular medical tests and scans doctor's appointments, and even the anniversary dates of diagnosis and other cancer events can evoke feelings of sadness and anxiety. Extra support is needed during this time. There can also be many challenges in recovery. In my experiences, it's not as if other challenges in life say, hey, coping with cancer right now? No problem. We'll just take care of everything else that you're concerned about. Often other problems actually become a little worse because you're not able to attend to them in the same way. Other life challenges are still a part of our lives. And if there are ongoing feelings of fear, anxiety, tearfulness, sadness, and depression, a mental health professional experienced in cancer can be very helpful. Most hospitals who treat people coping with cancer have a psychosocial unit or a mental health unit with professionals who are trained to understand the challenges that come with cancer. I think that any healthcare professional that you choose to see does need to have some experience with the cancer story because it's a specific kind of need. And so asking for help is a sign of strength and not for weakness. It's important that just like the body gets treatment and is taken care of, so too does the mind and the heart and the spirit. 
asking for help and learning how to do it is important because it's part of you doing better, is part of healing. And caregivers need help too. They are going through a lot of stress as well. And so caregivers, you need support and you have many similar psychosocial needs as the patient does. When I ask caregivers what is the most important skill they need, well, one laughed and said, ESP, I need to be psychic in order to predict how she's going to feel day to day. Caregivers need to have a self-plan too, a self-care plan. Friends, exercise, walking, going out for coffee, watching sports, playing sports. All the things that you enjoyed before your diagnosis now come into play to help you cope. And if it is hard for you, you too can seek support from a professional. This is not because you are weak, but because you are wise. Patients I work with often report great relief when they know that their loved ones are taking good care of themselves. And here I am with my caregiver, uh, some, my husband who's stuck by me through all of the challenges of treatment and recovery. And so this is a brief overview. And each of us experienced this cancer in our own way. I suppose the most important part of what we're talking about tonight is that asking for help, seeking help is a wise thing to do. And while most of us are new to asking for help, it's an adaptive coping skill that goes a long way in helping you manage. Contact Bladder Cancer Canada if you're having difficulties coping or managing, or you just want to talk to somebody who really understands. They are here to listen and to help. So there we go. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Claire. All right, so um, as you've heard by listening to Claire, we are very fortunate to have such a kind and capable professional training who is also training our own peer support volunteers. So uh, thank you for extending the scope of your service to our community of patients and caregivers this evening. My pleasure. All right, fantastic. So we're running right on time, folks, which is uh, really good news for this evening. We'll um, be all wrapped up here as planned by 8.30. But at this point in time, um, I'd like to open the floor to some general questions. Um, so all speakers are asked to ensure they are unmuted or that they unmute if they're about to answer a question. Um, again, the best way um, to, to submit your question is to type it in the question box on the GoTo panel on the right side of your screen. Um, we've already got a few here. So Carrie Abbott, uh, BCC Program Manager, is here with me this evening, is going to be um, reading questions out loud to our presenters here, and uh, she's going to get us started. Carrie? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. So first question is for Amy. Uh, the question is, what about swimming? Yeah, and I suppose swimming. that depends on, you know, whether someone's had recently had surgery or has yes. a healing ostomy or something similar to that. But uh, overall, overall, please. really, swimming is great. Um, all I would say with there is make sure um, you're checking with your surgeon that they OK it for it uh, once the surgery's happened, that the scar is safe to be getting wet for that amount of time. But swimming is really great for cardiovascular and range of motion. And it's, yeah, it's an awesome activity to do for sure. Okay, great. So the next one I have here is for Astrid. And that is, do you recommend eating organic foods? Oh, that's a good question. Not across the board. If people want to be, um, including organic food, that's fine. Uh, the most important thing is to make sure that you do fit in your fruits and vegetables, specifically on those choices. If people are concerned about pesticide residue and um, that kind of thing, sometimes we'll review with them 
maybe the foods that tend to have like a more absorption like the soft fleshy uh, fruit for example and maybe choose those organic um, but it really is not a recommendation across the board especially looking at the labeling and um, no research has ever shown that it was uh, really uh, better and there is a huge cost difference so if people say now eat an apple every three days because they're so expensive that's going to be a, a limitation so we really look at it as an individual if certainly people can afford the, the organic food and they feel more comfortable with that and they're still able to eat uh, the proper quantities of food in following the recommendations um, certainly that's uh, an individual choice Great. Okay, I have a comment, I think, more so for Claire. Um, denial is also a poor escape that can actually hurt us. What are your thoughts on denial and how to overcome it? Oh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> denial is more than a river in Egypt. Um, when I think of denial, I think there's many different levels of it. There is outright denial of the diagnosis, which is almost sort of dissociative. No, it didn't happen to me. There can be denial of the seriousness of it. Well, it's cancer, but it's not that bad. Or there can be denial about treatments. No, I'm not going to have that. I'm not going to have this. Or there can be denial about the outcome. And so denial is a tricky thing. I don't usually see denial as a solid kind of entity. It may phase in and out. And sometimes I think of denial as being adaptive. Um, it can be adaptive when people are waiting for test results and they're very anxious and they just kind of shut the door inside their heads and say, I'm not going to think about that. I think one has to look at what the consequences are of denial um, in an individual case. I think also recognizing that it may come and go and as people feel more settled with it, uh, with their situation, and they have a non-judgmental listening ear, that it may be easier for them to begin to release some of their resistance and lack of acceptance of the situation. Since I don't know the circumstances, I'm speaking very generally, I'm not sure whether that's helpful. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I have another one here for Astrid, and that is, you talked about supplements and that there aren't really any formal, di uh, I guess, recommendations. But what what are your thoughts on things like turmeric? If uh, taken as food, that would be ideal. If people, um, you know, want to cook with it or want to add it to some of their food, that would be great. It would be much better than taking a supplement of uh, curcumin, for example. Um, and certainly a general um, multiple vitamin can be a safe option, uh, but we usually don't recommend like huge uh, quantities of uh, potions or different vitamins and that. Okay, I have another one for you, um, Astrid. Green tea. There has been some research, I believe, on uh, how it can fight or prevent cancer. Any thoughts on that? Uh, certainly, I think the recommendation is not more than four cups a day, like the 250 mils. And um, I think it's been mostly effective, like in the Petri dish. So uh, it's certainly not going to harm if people want to use it. It's an, it could be a nice beverage, uh, hot or cold. Uh, um, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking here. Some are now coming through just now, so I've had a chance to read through them. Um, Okay, still looking. Uh, okay, um, some bladder cancer patients are also asking about foods that promote bladder health, i.e. cranberry. Any comments on this? There's not really a, a, a thing related to breast, uh, to uh, bladder cancer with that. Okay, okay. I don't think it's going to harm. Like when people take it, something as a food, like difference between taking a, a cup of green tea or some kind of green tea extract uh, powder that could get too concentrated. Certainly people want to incorporate some cranberry juice. That's That would be fine. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, why not more than four cups of oh, water per I day? It, I think it's more of a safety kind of thing. Okay. All right, sorry, they're coming in fast and furi furious. I'm just trying to keep up, <laughs> so mm -hmm. bear with I think me four here. four cups is quite generous. <laughs> Pardon? I thought four cups is quite generous, but that was uh, some of the guidelines that were released uh, a mm -hmm. few years ago. Okay. I think it's more related to general cancer. Yeah. Okay, I'm uh, going back to my questions here. Should caffeine be avoided? Everything in moderation, usually. Okay, so it's the same goes for coffee because there's another question. Some research seems to point to coffee promoting promoting bladder cancer. Hmm. Don't know if you've heard that <laughs> or any oh, cancer. promoting bladder cancer. Oh no, I don't think it's been proven. Like I think a lot of uh, like informations of it is out there that um, gets misconstrued. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Claire. Uh, is emotional fragility a common long-term side effect? Okay, so have emotional PTSD. <laughs> yeah, well, this is this is something that is really interesting. I think some of us have more vulnerabilities than others, and it's that it will depend on a, a whole bunch of things. One thing that it depends on is our own history with cancer. So I do some work with people who are coping with genetic cancer or families who have had multiple cases of cancer. And so they carry uh, many more stories, many more personal stories, which may have an influence to their own emotional recovery. Other people may have had other trauma, which leaves them at a risk for post-traumatic symptoms of flashbacks, anxiety. Um, okay, great. And uh, feelings of panic. Mm -hmm. It's going to depend really on the story. Ongoing fragility is something that can be talked about, um, and some coping strategies can be put in place, like learning how to breathe deeply, how to induce the relaxation response. And many therapists can help people um, learn how to cope with that sense of vulnerability. Okay, great. Uh, I'm not sure any of you can answer this. Um, of what value are essential oils in cancer care? I'm guessing that doesn't really, isn't something that any of you can speak to. And there isn't a whole lot of uh, concrete, good scientific evidence behind that, unless any of you have any comments further on that. My experience suggests that essential oils like lavender can be soothing. And when people are anxious, a calm environment, um, no harsh lights, no bright sound, no loud sounds, uh, and feelings and smells that are, are calming like lavender cannot harm anybody. Right. So nothing curative or preventative, but helping with the um, the emotional side effects. Okay. Carrie, uh, Carrie, it's yes. Tammy. I think yep. we have time for maybe one more question. We're just okay. going to wrap it up here in a minute, if okay. there is one. Um, uh, well, just a question about uh, from Ast for Astrid about kefir and uh, flax. Uh, obviously, we know those are both, you know, beneficial. Uh, but do you have any comments on that? Um, certainly. And some people may not know what kefir is, so maybe you can oh, explain that. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fermented um, like yogurt drink kind of thing. I could describe it like. Uh, certainly, the uh, for, like there's a lot of good information on fermented food being good for the gastrointestinal tract, good for the um, um, sort of the microbes that are uh, uh, living inside our gut. Um, so that the, is, it's considered a milk product in the Canada's Food Guide. So we look at getting approximately three servings a day uh, from that group. Um, the flax, if people are grounding it down, then they're going to be getting the omega-3 fatty acids that's found in there. If you have it as a whole seed, it really just helps with constipation because you're not absorbing any of the uh, good fats or the good proteins in there. 
And correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard that you should grind it up as you use it or it loses yeah. its effectiveness. Freshness even, yeah, yeah. and yeah. yeah, benefits for sure. Yeah, because any oil can go rancid quite quickly. Okay, well, there was one individual trying to ask a question on her mobile device, and I just answered on how she could do that. I don't know if she'll manage to figure it out in the next minute, but if that individual is listening, yeah, if that individual is listening, please feel free to email us at the uh, address that's showing up on the screen now. Oh, great, great. So, thank you, Carrie. Um, with with just one minute remaining, I'd like to wrap things up. And I'd again like to extend our sincerest appreciation to Amy, Astrid, and Claire for joining us this evening. Um, this was our very first webinar, so we had to have them uh, join us for practice sessions several times. So we truly appreciate your time and uh, what you've given here this evening. And it's because of caring and generous professionals like yourselves that we are able to offer these sessions free of charge to the patients and caregivers we support. I'd also like to thank the rest of you for being with us. Uh, we hope you gained some new information this evening that will enable you to live well with bladder cancer and beyond. If you'd like to speak individually with one of our peer support volunteers, please contact us. We also encourage you to join us online for our discussion forums or subscribe to our newsletters. And lastly, we invite you to volunteer with us if and when you're ready. There are many ways in which you can help us fulfill our mission. Please be reminded that you will receive a recording of this webinar as well as a feedback survey over the next few days and we encourage you to complete those so we can continually improve the services we offer here at Bladder Cancer Canada. Wishing you all well this evening and please, please stay in touch. <laughs>